Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for June 20th, 2018. As always, I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to bring you a roundup of all that is new in space and astronomy. Now, today is an exceedingly slow news day. I, I don't know if it's just that point in the summer where everyone is hurriedly wor- her- is is working really hard to get things done but aren't actually submitting their papers yet or if it just happens to be this particular Wednesday isn't one with a lot of news. Either way what I decided to do was go crawling through the astronomical archives. In astronomy we have a tradition of trying to make our research publicly accessible so that people like you who don't have subscriptions to the high-end professional journals can go ahead and well see what your tax dollars are paying for uh, if you're in any of the many nations that has an astronomical program or if you're like me and work at a small nonprofit that can't afford institutional licenses to the big name journals uh, we still have a place to go to get the papers we need to read to do our research In astronomy, the place that we store everything is archive.org in the Astro PH section. This stands for astrophysics. When people have completed papers, they uh, will sometimes submit them when they're done, when they're submitting them to the journal, asking for comments, asking for feedback. Uh, Those aren't the papers I'm going to bring to you because we work to only bring peer-reviewed research or review papers. This means that the work that we're discussing, the results that we're highlighting is information that multiple people have assessed as being completely credible. Now, I I may actually be able to bring you visuals. Um, Now, in addition to submitting things as soon as uh, they're completed, people also submit things to the archive once they're accepted for publication, uh, once they're presented at conferences, and these are the things that we're going to work to bring you today. Now we had three stories uh, out of the dozens upon dozens that got submitted to the archive yesterday that I wanted to talk about in particular. And I'm going to live dangerously and try and bring up some visuals. That almost worked. Let me fix how this looks. No, I'm not going to touch anything. I have a whirly rainbow again. Um, So the, the first paper is one that looks at just what it takes to model the effects of carbon dioxide in the Earth and other terrestrial worlds upper atmospheres. As you may know, uh, different gases in our atmosphere can act to help uh, protect us from light coming in from space. So this, this is the role of our ozone layer in many cases. They can also work to trap, well, light within our atmosphere. Oh, my visuals are randomly changing on their own. Uh, So what this team that was working at the University of Vienna and the Austrian Academy of Sciences wanted to do was write software to model how it is that carbon monoxide in the uppermost parts of the atmosphere over long periods of time uh, is is capable of um, well, mediating the Earth's cooling in this case. Now, one of the things that this paper by C.P. Johnstone, M. Goodall, H. Lammer, and K.G. Kisly-Yakova brings to the foreground is just how difficult this is. You may, along with many other people, be periodically befuddled that Astronomers are constantly, and planetary scientists are constantly saying, well, new, ma- new models show the Earth will actually rise in temperature this much in this many years. No, 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 it actually won't do that. Part of the reason for all of these difficulties 
is when we're writing computer models, we often start out with what are called one-dimensional models. These are models that start at the surface of the planet and cut a single line all the way up through the atmosphere and look to see how having different chemical abundances, different temperatures, different pressures at each of these different altitudes along this single line through the atmosphere can affect the other layers within the atmosphere. This is, like I said, a one-dimensional model. And right now, one-dimensional models are the kinds of models that we're often using to model our atmosphere. And this paper is yet one more one-dimensional model. Our atmosphere isn't one-dimensional. It's actually three-dimensionals with particles side by side. Uh, all interacting at every layer in, uh, in an environment rich with convective uh, cells rising and sinking, rich with radiative uh, cooling and heating, and all of these different factors are what mediate the weather and mediate the actual climate over long periods of time. Now, with all those caveats that the actual atmosphere is a whole lot more complicated than this model, what they were able to find is that changing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is capable of significantly changing the thermal properties of our atmosphere. To, to quote the, the abstract, Increasing the carbon dioxide abundances leads to massive reductions in thermospheric temperature. This means that the uppermost parts of our atmosphere cool radically with the intro introduction of carbon dioxide. Contraction of the atmosphere, this means our atmosphere gets smaller, um, so there'll be less drag on the inter International Space Station, for instance. Um, and reductions of the ion densities, indicating that carbon dioxide can significantly influence atmosphere erosion. Continuing to read, and then I'll go back and explain all of this. Our models for the evolution of the Earth's um, upper atmosphere indicate that the thermospheric structure has not changed in the last two gig years and is unlikely to change significantly in the next few. So, what this translates into is the carbon dioxide that we're producing at lower atmospheres isn't making its way up to the uppermost layers of the atmosphere, those uppermost layers that uh, are where weather balloons end up, where uh, stratospheric rockets fly, where eventually our suborbital spacecraft will go. These uppermost layers of the atmosphere are unaffected by what we're doing here at the surface of the atmosphere. And this is good because it's the composition of what's going on at those high levels that affects our planet's ability to retain its atmosphere. If our planet's atmosphere bloats out too much, and we do see changes in the size of the Earth's atmosphere on a regular basis, but it all keeps returning to the same mean. Um, and I'm not sure where the chat went. Um, I apologize for the chat seemingly dying on this. Uh, let me go back to host only. There's the chat. Um, so uh, at the uppermost layer in the atmosphere, if we reduce the amount of CO2, the atmosphere will have a tendency to bloat out further, it will have a tendency to cool off less efficiently, and so in the uppermost layers of the atmosphere, it's actually important for us to have this carbon dioxide. So this is one of those interesting cases, just like ozone, where the same chemical can have different roles at different points in the atmosphere. In this case, uh, the, the carbon dioxide is good, keeps our atmosphere less bloated up, less uh, likely to be blown away by the solar wind, and allows it to cool off more effectively. Um, that's, that's weird that 
I apologize for the errors in my display. Um, so, so moving on to our second uh, story, and let's see if I can bring up a visual without destroying the chat. Nope, chat went away. So here's a visual of a star forming region, uh, and now I will return to the other view. Uh, so star forming regions like the one I just showed you are home to gas in many different densities, many different temperatures, and at some densities and temperatures, this gas is capable of achieving very specific conditions where we end up with a microwave equivalent of a laser naturally taking place. These are called masers. And masers can form in the disks around stars that are just in the process of forming planets. Now, we've been actively trying to figure out how to, well, how to map out the structure of planet formation for a long time. And ALMA has been an amazing help in this regard. ALMA being the Atacama Large Millimeter Array down in Chile. Now, with ALMA, in general, we get back these beautiful images that only give us resolutions of a few tens of astronomical unit, units in telling us what's going on. We'd love to be able to understand what's going on at scales that are, well, closer to the scale of at least the distance between the Earth and the Sun, where we have three different planets hanging out. And astronomers uh, working largely in South Africa, uh, Virginia, Poland, um, have been working on this. This is a massively multi-institutional team. Uh, so there's a large group of people who worked on this project that are at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Charlotte. This work is led by Todd Hunter. We also have folks at, Nicol at the Nicholas Copernicus University in Poland, uh, the Department of Physics and Astronomy in Nigeria, uh, at, the at the Square Kilometer Array in Cape Town, um, and a variety of other observatories around the world. Now, with this new work being done still in the radio wavelengths, still in the small wavelengths, in this case looking at microwave wavelengths, it's been realized that the super narrow lines that occur when you have excited uh, molecules that form masers, these super narrow lines can be used to carefully map out velocity differences at these smaller scales of 1 to 10 astronomical units. So this team looked at a variety of different molecules uh, from uh, gases such as water vapor, CH3OH, uh, OH molecules, methane molecules, uh, silicon oxide, uh, H2CO, all of these different molecules have the potential to become properly excited to create these microwave versions of lasers naturally occurring again. Uh, masers, uh, they're, they're mostly found around massive protostars. So we're not finding these objects around stars like our own sun. Here we're looking towards the kinds of stars that are likely to perhaps go supernova later on in their life or at least die in a very different way than our own sun. These particular uh, large stars with their masers around them are now providing us a way to map out at the 1 to 10 AU level. Now, we haven't been able to find planets yet this way, but they are being able to, to show differences in velocity of the disks of gas around these stars. So this is a new technique that um, is now just waiting to be perfected and used over and over again until it does start to give us 
um, better understanding of the formation of these massive stars and potentially even the turbulence that is created by forming planets around these stars. Astronomy is an incremental process. All science is an incremental process. You have to start by figuring out what tools do I have at my disposal? And sometimes this includes inventing new tools. And this is what we're seeing is people inventing new tools. And then you perfect how to use the tools, you practice using those tools, and then you discover things with the tools. It's the rare case where you have the Jocelyn Bell Burnell, Burnell discovery of pulsars while you're out there detecting your new radio array. Uh, those kinds of discoveries do happen. But most of the time, it's a slow, incremental process built up by papers detailing your new techniques, your new instruments, until one day you have that amazing scientific discovery. And this paper points towards that happening. Now, in our final... Um, so, so I see a question. Hanny is asking, how far away can a maser be seen? Um, I... I don't actually know the answer to that. I think it depends on how big a telescope you use, clearly. Uh, I know they can be found readily throughout our nearby galaxies. So we're looking at at least tens to hundreds of light years and perhaps further. I just don't know. Um, in terms of being used for signaling, uh, it would take a whole lot of energy to figure out how to uh, trigger and untrigger these particular events um, and and use them to communicate but it is an idea that many people who have have been thinking about now to go to our final story of the day and here I apologize I'm going to eat the image for uh, eat the chat for a few moments so that I can explain this artist's rendering. This isn't an actual image. This is an artist's rendering. So this artist's rendering of a quasar shows you a disk around a active black hole. And the reason we call it active is because it has a disk around it that is eating things. And as the disk eats things, charged particles moving at high velocities in orbit around the black hole are capable of building up an extraordinarily strong magnetic field. This magnetic field drives particles to form jets coming off perpendicular to the disk of material. So here we see the jet in this artist's rendering, the accretion disk, and while this artist's rendering takes artistic liberties, there are also various clouds of material floating around, well not floating, it's, it's not like there's an atmosphere, orbiting around in the open area above the accretion disk. Now to go back to the other view where you guys will get your chat back. Um, now with quasars, uh, having all of these different particles superheated in this disk and also moving at a variety of different wavelengths puts us in a position to see what are called broad absorption lines. Broad absorption lines are lines that in spectra that have been thickened because we have uh, particles that are moving towards us and absorbing light. We have particles that are moving away from us and absorbing light. We have particles that are passing in front of us, absorbing light. And all of these different velocities of particles that we observe, because of Doppler shifting, causing things to get bluer when they're moving towards us, redder when they're moving away, all these different Doppler shifts of the light being absorbed by all of these different atoms causes what would normally be a single wavelength of light that would get absorbed to now become a multitude of wavelengths being absorbed. These broad absorption lines can be seen sometimes to change properties, to become narrower, to um, just sometimes even appear to disappear. 
And in a paper uh, titled Using the Properties of Broad Absorption Line Quasars to Illuminate Quasar Structure, a group of researchers led by Suk Li Yong uh, at the University of Melbourne in Australia uh, have looked at how can we use the fact that sometimes we see these broad absorption lines to determine what's that internal structure of the quasar like. And they've gone through, looked at a variety of different systems, then run theoretical models and carefully compared uh, their, their models to reality and then created machine learning algorithms that can go through and based on what we understand from observations of this kind of galaxy that we're capable of resolving has these spectral properties. Based on training the algorithm with that kind of information, they're now able to look and say, these systems have these internal properties based on the spectra that we see in these broad absorption line systems. So in this particular case, we again have more incremental advancements brought to us thanks to the development of a new tool. In this case, it's the machine learning, deep learning algorithms. In the past two years, uh, Google has released significant libraries that allow us to better take advantage of the graphical cards on various computers. Services like Amazon Web Services, the Google services allow anyone with money, uh, about $20 an hour it turns out, to spin up a server capable of doing machine learning algorithms. And while most of the memes you see of, I trained my machine learning algorithm with 10,000 menus and here is the menus it came up with, most of those are just made up by silly human beings. But what these machine learning algorithms are capable of doing is being trained on broad absorption line galaxies, in this case, uh, being trained on binaries in other cases, being trained on the shapes of galaxies in yet other cases, we are capable of using these algorithms to train machines to look at our data for us and tell us what is there. This is a fabulous discovery that is well-timed to better allow us to deal with the flood of data that's coming from the Gaia mission, the flood of data that will be coming from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the flood of data that already has come at us from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. In this case, we now have a new tool and new software that will allow us to do more science with the vast databases of data that is out there just waiting to be explored and that happens to be too many gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes for any one person to process alone. So we are very grateful for our machine learning robot overlords and the science that they allow us to do. So that concludes uh, all the science I have to bring you today. And now I'm going to go ahead and take questions. Now, if I'm looking in weird directions, it's because um, I'm having te technical difficulties with my streaming computer. So I'm looking down at a laptop that is in front of me. Um, yes, I, I am feeling better. Thank you, everyone, for your kind words. Uh, I, I picked up some sort of a something that just made my system. It wasn't pretty. We'll just go with that. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling better. Um, so uh, scrolling backwards to, to see. Okay, so I got Hanny's question earlier on. Uh, I'm not seeing anything since then. I love all of your pew pews. Pew pews make me very happy. Um, okay. Uh, so Hanny asks, is machine learning better than supercomputers in some instances? What specifically, if anything? Um, so machine learning uses currently 
graphical processing units instead of computational processing units. These are the GPUs that render the graphics for video games. We are developing supercomputers essentially of graphical processing units. So these are computers that have massive numbers of gra graphical processing units. And, and so it's a different kind of processing. GPUs are developed to do massive parallel computing. They can do the exact same task 10 bazillion times simultaneously. This is how they render every pixel on your screen, every um, character in your video game, how they are used to do massive uh, CGI animations for movies. And we're taking that same, do one task a bazillion times, ability of the GPU, and doing it over and over and over. These are each of the different models. And what the software is working to do is converge so that it can find what is the best possible solution for any given situation. Now, when we say supercomputers, what we're generally talking about is computational processing units. This is where we talk about CPUs and supercomputers solving games like Go and chess, where what you're actually looking at is they aren't learning how to do things by playing 10,000 games. They're playing this game in this moment by running through all the possible solutions. So these are parallel computational processes. So with machine learning, we're building computers with massive graphic processing units. With supercomputers, we're building massive computational processes. Uh, they work different. Um, and I honestly don't know why we have distinct language for them, but currently we do. Um, I hope that explained it. Um, <laughs> yeah, Noel, I think I'm using the same computer your girlfriend has. Actually, mine's maybe a little newer. I have the late 2012 model iMac. Um, yes, crypto mining uses GPUs. Uh, because again, it's the same process being done a bazillion different times. Um, so I, I don't know that specific case, DPI 2009. Uh, you have wandered out of my knowledge of these things. Um, And, and yes, Hanny, uh, the, the um, machine learning is better in some instances than simply programming computational stuff at it. The, the way to think about it is if you're using machine learning, what it can do is it can figure out, okay, someone looked at this image and they identified it as this human. Someone looked at this image and identified it as this different human. And you train it with 100 pictures of each human. And then you set it loose and it can mark all the rest of the photos. Now, we haven't had to tell the software the eye separation. We haven't had to tell the software to look at the ears. What the software has done is it said, OK, these two are the same thing. I'm going to identify for myself what are the similarities in this image. And the computers may be queuing on, in on something completely different than what we as humans would choose. And so it's more. go forth and figure out the rest of these and the computers do it it's kind of awesome um, okay looking to see are there any other questions out there um, did my oh crap
Okay, I think we're back. Sorry about that. My my computer completely froze. Completely froze. Um, so, uh, do you have any final questions before my computer completely gives up the ghost for the day? Um, so, while you're typing in the qu your questions, uh, for those of you joining us, this is, as the title indicates, The Daily Space. We bring you a quick roundup of each day's news from space and astronomy every Monday through Friday here at CosmoQuest X. I'm Dr. Pamela Gay, and along with Dr. Andreas Plazis, uh, we work to make science understandable and translate everything out for everyone who shows up. So come along, bring a friend. Thank you so much for the cheer, Trekker Kev. Um, that is awesome. This show is sustained by you. Uh, please give us a follow if you like what you see and get notifications of every new episode that is coming out. And uh, your subscriptions and your bits really help. Directly following the show, we're going to have Dr. Matthew Francis and his uh, pupil, uh, uh, Big Joe, um, are going to be here doing their Astro 101 lecture series. Um, don't let the name intimidate you. Um, Matt is uh, go giving a friendly and entertaining series of talks on just what it is our universe has to offer to teach astronomy to our programmer, Joe, who knows the software but doesn't always know his space. So join in while Joe learns about the universe and you can learn alongside him. Um, I will be back on this channel next uh, on Friday. Tomorrow, Andreas is going to do this. Um, actually, I will be back tomorrow night to bring you learning space. Uh, Dr. WD40 is going to be here as our guest uh, talking about astrobiology and uh, the work he does here helping you learn science on Twitch. So thank you so much. Um, the stream is going to temporarily end here on my computer and I'm going to pass you off to what I expect to be a much healthier computer and an impatient Matt and Joe because I just stole six minutes of their time. Um, apologies to Matt and Joe and thank you all. Yes, uh, Dr. Matthew Richardson. I'm sorry if I said Fra Francis. We have two of them. Uh, so. Uh, I pass this off to Dr. Matthew Richardson, Matt, and Big J, who is also a Joe, and it's all quite confusing, so I'm going to say goodbye and let them introduce themselves. <laughs>